If you live in the Pacific Northwest of the United States, then you want to pay close attention to the ending of today's video. But before we get into today's story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please ask the like button to go for a walk with you in Northeastern Australia and push them into a gimpy gimpy plan. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's story. In 1985, 36-year-old Michael Reamer was a roofer in Tacoma, Washington, and his boss described him as being a work hard, play hard type of guy. In the winter months when there really wasn't any roofing to be done, Mike would supplement his income by trapping coyote, mink, and muskrat in the forest that butted up against the Nisqually River, which was an 80 mile stretch that ran right near his home. Most of the traps Mike would set would be far away from any actual trail because wherever there was a trail, you would have human foot traffic and that would scare away the animals that you're trying to catch in your trap. And so as a result, he would place his traps in very remote, you know, isolated sections of the forest which meant he needed to know where those sections were. And so over the 15 years he spent trapping in this forest, he got really, really good at navigating it. It was like he had a map in his head of where everything was in this forest. Plus, Mike was already an avid outdoorsman, and so navigating a forest and being out in the wild was something that just kind of came naturally to him. Mike's girlfriend was a 21-year-old woman named Diana Robertson, and they had a two-year-old daughter named Crystal. Mike and Diana had a rocky relationship, to say the least. In fact, in October of that year, Diana had filed a restraining order against Mike after he had kicked in the door and thrown her to the ground. Mike also always carried a gun on him, and he had a very quick temper. But despite their significant relationship issues, the one thing they could always see eye to eye on was their daughter, Crystal. They adored her. And when it came to decisions about her, they were always on the same page. It was whatever is in the best interest of Crystal. In December of that year, Diana and Mike were able to reconcile. And so Diana threw the restraining order out. And in fact, she and Crystal moved back in with Mike, which made Crystal very, very happy. Just a couple of days after moving back in, they decided they wanted to go out and go camping together as a family. And then also pick out a real Christmas tree they could bring back for the holidays. And so they settled on an area that was gonna be in the same forest where Mike had all of his traps set. And they figured they could, you know, get their family time in, they could get their Christmas tree, and Mike would be able to check his traps, saving himself from making another trip later on. So on December 12th, the three of them loaded up into Mike's red pickup truck, and they drove the 30 minutes down towards Nisqually River, where there was this logging road that Mike would use to park his truck and then walk in to check his traps. So Mike pulls over on the side of the road, they all hop out, and Mike leads the way right into the middle of the woods. There's no trail. Mike is just bringing them to an area where one, his traps will be, and two, he thinks is suitable for camping and for looking for a Christmas tree. Later that afternoon, Crystal was spotted walking around a parking lot of a Kmart 20 miles away from where Mike had parked the car near Nisqually River. And she's just walking around. She looks totally confused. She's all alone. And the employees of the Kmart are looking out and they see this girl and they're all watching, waiting for, you know, her parents or a guardian or someone to walk over and show that they are with this girl. But after a couple of minutes when no one does that, one of the employees goes out and tries to talk to her. And this employee would say when she talked to the girl, she kept looking over her shoulder and she was just terrified the whole time. And so this employee asked her, you know, what's your name? And she didn't say anything. She asked her, you know, where are you coming from? You know, where are your parents? Who, who's looking after you? And to all the questions she was asked, she didn't say anything. She just looked terrified and was looking over her shoulder. And so this employee brings the girl back inside and they call the police. And so the police show up and they ask the girl the same questions that the employees have been asking her and the girl's still not speaking. And so after they made an announcement inside to say, hey, is anybody in here, the parent or guardian of this child and no one came forward, they said, okay, well, we have no other choice, but we're gonna have to move her to temporary foster care. And so they move her to a foster home and then they put an ad out in the newspaper that day with a picture of her, basically saying, if you know me, contact this number. Two days later, Crystal's maternal grandmother would see the picture in the newspaper and the ad did not have a description of, 
you know, how she was discovered. It just said she had been found at this particular Kmart. And if you know who she is, please contact this number. Even without the details, the grandmother knows something has gone wrong because there's no reason in the world those two parents would abandon their beloved Crystal. And so she calls Diana, she calls Mike, they don't pick up the phone. That's when she calls the number and she says, what's going on? I'm her grandmother, where is she? The police tell her to go to the foster home and they will meet her there and they're gonna talk about what happened. So the grandmother flies to the foster home and she arrives there before the police. She goes inside and Crystal is so happy to see her. It's the first time Crystal has really broken out of that kind of catatonic state she had been in ever since she was found at the Kmart. And so she runs up to her grandmother, they have this reunion and the grandmother's so happy to see Crystal, but she's also thinking, where are your parents? Where where are Diana and Mike? And so she asks Crystal, where are they, honey? Where is your mom? Where's your dad? And Crystal would speak to her grandmother and she would say, mommy's in the trees. Her grandmother didn't know what this meant. And so she tried to ask clarifying questions, but Crystal was not very verbal. She was not able to articulate more than what she was saying. So she just kept repeating it, saying, mommy's in the trees, mommy's in the trees. And so then the police show up and the grandmother turns to them and she says, where are her parents? Where are Mike and Diana? And the police turn to her and they're like, we don't know. We found her abandoned in this parking lot and she wasn't speaking and no one knew anything about her. And so until right now, we didn't even know her parents' names. Do you have any idea where they might be? And the grandmother's like, I have no idea. I mean, I'm just learning about all of this stuff now. But when I came over here, Crystal said to me, mommy's in the trees. And you know, she's not, she's not very verbal, so she can't explain much more than that. But she just kept saying mommy's in the trees and I know Mike liked to go camping in this one area near the Nisqually River. He keeps traps out near the edge of the water. He, he catches some small animals out there. So I know he goes out there and goes camping. And so maybe that's what Crystal's referencing, that they were in the trees. So they were in that forest over there. The grandmother also gave the police the address to Mike's house and the police use that information to launch their search for the parents. And so the first place they go is Mike's house and all the lights are off, the door is locked and his red pickup truck, because the grandmother said he drove a red pickup truck, his red pickup truck is not there. And so they rule out his house, they're not there. And they begin flying a plane, not only over Tacoma, which is the area where they were living, but also over that forest that was right up against the Nisqually River. And as they're flying, they're looking for campsites that could potentially be Mike and Diana, but they're also looking for the red pickup truck, which is fairly distinctive. And after a couple of days of flying all over the forest and looking around the side streets and, and putting people in the forest walking on foot, they couldn't find anything and they turned the search off. And they would tell the grandmother and the rest of the family on Diana's and Mike's side that they really just needed to wait for more information to come in because they couldn't just spend an indefinite amount of time scanning a fairly large area. They have all of Tacoma and this huge forest. And so everyone just had to wait. Two months later, a man and his dog were out walking on this logging road that was about 10 miles away from the Nisqually River and 30 miles away from the Kmart where Crystal was found. And they're walking on this road and they see way off in the distance, there's this truck that's pulled over to the side of this road. And even from a distance, they can tell it's covered in snow, but it hasn't snowed recently. There's, there's snow on the ground, but the amount of snow that is on this truck indicates it's been sitting here for quite a while. And so as they get closer to the truck, this man is looking around, seeing if maybe the owner is nearby, even though it seemed unlikely given the fact that it looks like it's been sitting here a while. And so after he stands there for a minute, looking around, feeling pretty confident there's no one in the area, he brushes the snow off the passenger side window and he looks inside and he doesn't see anything at first, but he notices on the passenger front seat, there's a significant amount of blood on the seat or what appears to be blood. And this startles the guy. So he backs up from it and he and his dog very quickly leave this area because they're in this kind of desolate, you know, logging road. He's pretty isolated. And so he gets out of there as quickly as he can. And when he gets to a phone, he calls the police. Police show up and they brush the rest of the snow off and they find it is a red pickup truck. It's Mike's red pickup truck. Mike and Diana's case had been very big news in the area when it happened. And the news had really not gone away. People were out there looking for this couple. And so as soon as they saw this was Mike's truck, they start fanning out and searching the area, seeing if they can find any other clues about what happened to Mike and Diana. And very quickly, they discover Diana's body. She was located not far from the red truck, just barely off the road in the forest. She was under several inches of snow and she had been stabbed 17 times and there was a tube sock wrapped around her neck. There was no sign of Mike, but once they got inside the truck, there was a manila folder that had been tucked up on the dashboard that just said, I love you, Diana. 
when police showed that message to Diana's family, they all said, that looks like Mike's handwriting. He used to send us handwritten Christmas cards and that looks exactly the way he writes. As for the blood that was on the passenger seat inside the truck, it had been sitting out for too long, so they weren't able to determine whose blood it was, but they were able to determine it was human. So between the blood on the front seat, the note that was left on the dashboard, the personal furious nature of the way in which Diana was killed, combined with Mike's history of violence and his disappearance, because he's not here anymore, that all made it seem an awful lot like Mike was the guy that did this. In fact, this made for a very tidy ending to a mystery that had actually started before Diana had been killed. On August 10th, 1985, so four months before Mike, Diana, and Crystal ventured off into the woods near Nisqually River, 27-year-old Stephen Harkins and his girlfriend, 42-year-old Ruth Cooper, were going camping near Nisqually River in the same forest. They were actually about 15 miles from where Diana's body was ultimately found, and they were very close to a number of Mike's traps, although they probably didn't realize they were near them. During their trip, an unknown assailant walked up to their campsite in the middle of the night and shot them both to death. Stephen was found right away, and he was found inside of his sleeping bag at their campsite, indicating he had been killed in his sleep. Ruth wasn't found for months, and when she was, she was found a mile and a half away from the campsite, and she had a tube sock tied around her neck the same way Diana had. And the knot that was used on the tube sock was even the same as the knot used on Diana's tube sock. So the similarity was just too much to overlook. And so to the police, they're thinking, Mike has to be the guy in both of these cases. You know, he attacked Ruth and Steven, perhaps because they were you know, on his territory where his traps were and he didn't like that. You know, he has a history of violence and so he attacks them. And then a couple months later, he attacks Diana and then he flees. As for his daughter being found alive at the Kmart, it would seem he just did not have it in him to harm his own child. And so he dropped her off at the Kmart before he ultimately fled. Despite everything seeming to fit just perfectly to where, yep, Mike is definitely the guy, not only for Diana, but for Ruth and for Steven, we figured it out. Despite that being the overwhelming feeling, there were a couple of questions that remained unanswered. Like the FBI, they were unable to confirm the handwriting on that folder that said, I love you, Diana. They were unable to confirm that that in fact was Mike's handwriting. Diana's family was really convinced it was his, but the FBI said it's not necessarily a match. And then you have the motives for the two crimes. We can understand one of them. Him attacking Diana, unfortunately, people attack their partners all the time, and so we can, we can understand that, we can rationalize that. But for him to attack Ruth and Steven, two total strangers, because what, they encroached on your land, even though it's not your land, it's public land, and you just happen to put your traps out there, that didn't seem like a strong enough reason for him to want to kill them. But the circumstantial evidence was overwhelmingly pointing at Mike being the guy. You have the fact that he's this violent guy with a history of domestic abuse. He knows this area well where both crimes were committed. You have the tube sock tied around Diana the same way it's tied around Ruth. It just had to be Mike. And so because the police felt so strongly it had to be Mike, they were willing to overlook these lingering questions. And so the police wanted to issue an arrest warrant for Mike, but they needed to be able to prove he was alive because if he was dead, then that calls into question his ability to have committed these two crimes. And so they didn't have proof he was alive. And so very quickly, this story faded out of the headlines because basically everybody believed Mike had done it and he had run off somewhere and maybe someday we'll figure out where he went and we'll bring him to justice. But until then, we know he's the guy. For years, no one heard from Mike, no one saw Mike. It was like he had just totally vanished. Crystal was raised by relatives and many of the detectives that were working on these cases eventually retired or moved on. Then, 25 years later, in March of 2011, a hiker was walking through the forest near the Nisqually River, about one mile from where Diana's body was found, and they would stumble upon a piece of a human skull. She calls the police, police show up, they search the area, and they discover another bone, a human jawbone and it would turn out it was Mike's. The rest of Mike's remains were never found, and because there was so little of him to work with, police were not able to determine a cause of death. However, they were able to date his death back to almost exactly the same time frame that Diana had died. 
Additionally, investigators believe the reason they did not find more of Mike's remains is because he had been buried. The two bones that were found, the skull and the jawbone, they were located within one mile of where Diana's body had been found. And that area, after Diana had been found, had been scoured. They looked everywhere for clues. And because he apparently died at the same time she did, he would have been out there and they would have found him. So the fact that they didn't find him can only mean he was underground. So this all meant Mike could not have been the killer. Because in order for him to have been the killer, he not only would have had to attack Diana and then drive his daughter to the Kmart and then drive back to the forest, he would then need to take his own life and then also somehow bury himself. Some of the police officers that had worked that case were still on the police force. And so when they heard this news about Mike not being the killer, they were like, you know, it never really made any sense that he would attack Ruth or Steven unless he was a serial killer. And then it clicked. They probably were dealing with a serial killer. It just wasn't Mike. And their only eyewitness was the toddler, Crystal, who apparently the serial killer could not bring themselves to harm. And so as a result, Crystal just sat there and watched these horrible things happen to her parents and then probably spent a fair amount of time with the serial killer afterwards because they needed to drive her to the Kmart. Investigators and her family had tried to get her to give more information about what she had witnessed, but all she could say was, mommy's in the trees. And so there are really only two interpretations of what that means. Either one, she was just stating that her mother was in the forest and that would have been accurate. Or she's remembering her mother trying to escape a serial killer by climbing up into a tree. Or maybe even that she was in the tree with her mother as they both were trying to escape a serial killer with a knife. So when the police have this revelation that Mike was not the killer, that in fact, that was probably a serial killer, and we know nothing about this serial killer besides what Crystal had to say as a toddler, and that didn't provide any sort of real clarity on who this person was or what their MO was. They went back and looked at all the unsolved murders in the Pacific Northwest, specifically around this forest. They discovered that in addition to Mike and Diana and Ruth and Steven, there were four other sets of couples that were killed in and around this forest. And all of them bared striking resemblances to one another. The most recent attack that is associated with the Tube Sock Killer occurred in 2006. But the reality is police don't really know anything about the Tube Sock Killer. All they know is that they're probably in the Pacific Northwest and they are definitely still at large. So that's gonna do it guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments what it is and where you found it. So give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we will pin you at the top of the comments section. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please go on a walk with the like button in Northeastern Australia and push them into a Gimpy Gimpy plan. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly three, four, even five video uploads. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's just johnballin416. I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.